All right, so beloved, we, we've been on a very long journey. We are drawing close to ending our teaching series. Actually, hopefully next week, we can end this series. And the name of the series is Back to the Basics, Meaning Business with God. Back to the Basics, Meaning Business with God. And um, when we started the series, I did a little bit of survey on our WhatsApp uh, platform. And uh, some of you indicated what you wanted to learn in the area of back, going back to the basics. And a lot of you, a few of you actually uh, mentioned that you want to learn about returning to your first love, going back to your first love. So today we're gonna to be talking about that. We're talking about a subject, return to your first love, return. Somebody say, I am returning to my first love. I am returning to my first love, amen, amen. So I want you to come with me to the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation chapter two, verses one to seven, one, to seven. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, and the, the subtitle of my in my Bible says, The Message to the Church in Ephesus. The Message to the Church in Ephesus. So let's read Revelation 2 1 to 7 from the New Living Translation. It says this Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. Verse four, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other, as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to do the it at first. You repent, I will remove your last stand place among the churches. But this is, <clears throat> praise the Lord, but this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Verse 7, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Amen and amen. All right. What a scripture. Amen. What a scripture. Actually, when I read verse four, the verse four from the New King James Version, it says this, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So, Beloved, this is a message that was sent by, by, uh, by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ revealed himself to um, the Apostle John when he was on the, on the island of Patmos. <clears throat> he was on the island of Patmos and Jesus revealed himself to him and he sent messages to seven different churches and the church of Ephesus was one of the churches that Jesus sent a message to, amen. 
And these are messages that were evaluating the churches and giving them feedback on rebuking them in the areas they need to improve and commending on them on the, in the areas that they are doing well. In fact, I don't know about you, but um, it is a wake up call for me to know that, hey, all along, although Jesus had ascended to the right hand side of the father in heaven, that he is still observing us. He is observing the churches. And beloved, when we say church, we're referring to you and I. Jesus is looking down right now. He was looking down last Wednesday. He is going to be looking down on you tomorrow on Monday to see how you are doing. And he is constantly evaluating us from the right hand of God in heaven. Amen. So the, the key word there is to be careful now because somebody is looking. Someone is evaluating. Someone is measuring our performance. Amen. So as, as we live our lives every day, we must live with the consciousness that we are being watched and we are being evaluated as we go. It, it's just like what happens in accounting where, you know, um, periodically, you know, um, auditors, um, auditors show up to evaluate the financial books of an organization. Most of the time they come in unannounced and then they present a report on how well they're doing. Again, I, I, I still don't know um, about the way that you look at this situation, but I would like to receive feedback. I would love for Jesus to give me feedback while I am still alive so I can fix my mess, amen, and correct my ways before the final day approaches, amen. I would love to receive that feedback. And, and, and that is what David, <clears throat> you know, the psalmist said in, um, in Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24, it is this kind of evaluation that he was craving. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Come on, somebody say, Lord, search my heart. Search my heart. Lord, look into my heart, my motives, my intentions, my motivations, oh God, my secret desires, and cleanse me, oh God. If there is any wicked way in me, there are any cockroaches in my cupboard, Lord, remove, help, cleanse me, Lord in the name of Jesus. That is a good prayer to pray. So Jesus gave this letter. He, he actually told the apostle John to write these words. He said, I need you to write these things down, have them delivered to the church in Ephesus. When, when, when I look at the letter that was sent to the church in Ephesus, in my opinion, I think that the Ephesus church was doing pretty well. They were doing quite well. Jesus mentioned all the good things that they were doing and what they were lacking. So let's look at it. Let's look at it. He said, I have seen your hard work. When it comes to hard work, oh, you guys really are a hardworking church. Amen. Secondly, he said that <clears throat> I have seen your patient endurance. You are a church that persevered in the face of challenges. Amen. They don't give up easily. So the efficient church is a church that always perseveres. They stick through and they push through things. They don't give up. Now, thirdly, Jesus said that, I know you don't tolerate evil people. Oh, my. They were a church that had no to uh, zero tolerance for evil meaning that they were a church that stood for righteousness and living right. They stood for righteousness. They stood for living right. And I, I think that's pretty, a, that's a great report about a church. And then the, the fourth thing Jesus said was that you have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not. 
and you have discovered that they are liars. So this is a church that examines people. They don't just accept people because they say they are called. They are a church where hypocrites do not survive. You can hide and, uh, and, and pretend in this church. You have to be the real deal when you are in the church of Ephesus. And what an awesome credibility for a church to have. And, and then Jesus said, you have patiently suffered for me without quitting. So this is a church that does not quit. They never gave up on the Lord. They faced hardship without quitting. And finally, Jesus said, you hate evil deeds. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Nicolaitans were backsliding members of the church that went outside to enjoy the pleasures of the world. So Jesus said, you hate those people just like I do. So this all sounds awesome. But then he said one thing in verse four. Then he said, although you appear to be doing quite well, right? I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You have left your first love. Oh my. So I, 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 you may be asking, just like I asked, what at all is this first love? And how powerful is this first love that all that this church is doing, all the good things that this church is doing, Jesus will say that, you know, he, if they don't return to their first love, he actually said, if they don't return to their first love, he said, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. I will come and quench your light. I will remove you from the map. You will no longer be recognizable. Wow. It's like saying you will cease to exist if you don't go back to your first love. If that one thing called first love can disqualify them, despite all the good things that they are doing, then that first love must be really a powerful thing, right? It must be a powerful thing. One against many good things that they were doing. So I have a few questions in mind today, beloved, and I believe you have those same questions. What are we referring to as our first love? What does it look like when, when you have a, a, your first love? When you go back to your first love, what does it look like? What does it look like when somebody loses or leaves? Actually, Jesus used the word, you have left your first love. He did not say you have lost your first love. Living is different. Living something is different from losing something. Well, when you lose something, it is an unconscious act. But leaving something is a conscious act. You are aware of it and you left it behind. So Jesus, when somebody lives their first love, what does it look like? Hallelujah. And finally, we want to look at how do we return to our first love? How do we return to our first love? So let's start by talking about what is your first love? What is first love at all, amen? What does it look like when somebody has their first love intact? So the phrase first love, I was looking at it and I, I considered it closely and I realized that the fact that they use first love is a suggestion that, hey, love comes in grades or in ranks. If there is first love, then there must also be second love and there must be third love, amen? If, if there is premium gas, <laughs> then there must also be, um, what is the second one? And then there must be common regular gas as well. So love seems to come in grades. And if you have been in love before, amen? I don't know how many of you, have been in love before, and how many of you are still in love right now? Maybe you want to put a comment. You can give us a wave, or you can put a comment in the comment section. Just say, I am in love. Amen. 
let us know I'm in love. There's a good thing to be in love. Um, and if you've been in love, you've tasted love before, you realize that over time, over time, there is something called the law of um, degeneration. Things degenerate over time. So things are gonna be working against the, the quality of your love. And if you're not very careful, if you're, you don't take some steps, some practical steps, your love reduces in quality or in ranking or in the grade, you know, that it had in the beginning, amen? So there are various stages of marriage. For instance, I, I, I remember the story of um, a, a man and a woman, when they were dating, you know, they were dating and then they later got married, just like most of us. And one of the things that they liked to do was to go for a walk together. Okay, they went for a walk periodically. And during their dating years, okay, they were on a walk. And while they were on the walk, the woman tripped accidentally on a rock. She tripped and then the man instantly rushed into action and held her, lifted her up and nursed her feet, you know, her foot, injured foot back to health. Okay, and he said something. The words that the man used were, oh, I wish I would have, it would have been me who got hurt instead of you. I, I would have liked to take your pain upon me. And those were the dating years. And then several years later, somebody said, mm -hmm. several years later, after they got married and had some children, and a few, you know, some water has passed under the bridge. They were, you know, on a walk again. And then the woman tripped another time. And this time around, this is what the man said. He said, hey, don't, don't you have eyes to see that big rock on the path? <laughs> so what, what happened here, man? The man's language has changed. The first time when they were dating, he said, I wish I would have been hurt instead of you. Now, after many years, he said, don't you have eyes to see that big rock? <laughs> so the tone has changed and that is called the law of degeneration. And so if you're married, we need to guard against the law of degeneration because when things are left unattended, they degenerate over time. Amen. The love became stale, you know, the enthusiasm and zeal has been taken out of it. And I pray that your love will never become stale. And this is what Jesus is warning us against. I want us to look at one scripture that demonstrates or epitomizes, you know, true love, first love. There is one scripture that shows us what first love looks like. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. Matthew 22, verse 37. Says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. I like the alls in there. So the alls are telling us the absoluteness, the all encompassing nature of first love. This is the kind of love that God is desiring from us. All your heart, not some of your heart, all your soul, not some of your soul, all your mind as well. Jesus wants all of us. God wants all of us minus none. So what is first love? In my understanding, first love is premium love. First love is a pure, original, unadulterated, and undiluted love that you had for God when you first became a Christian. When you met the Lord, or when the Lord found you, you remember the state that you were in when he reached out and found you and changed your destiny 
the love that you had for him, that is your first love. First love is captivating. It captivates you. It is overwhelming. It, it overwhelms you, right? It floods your heart. It, it drenches your soul and your mind. That is first love. If, if you would be very honest with us, amen, if you'd be very honest with us today, when you first became born again, your life, your dreams, your motivations, your language, your priorities were all about God. It was all about God. Amen. You had certain, you know, um, a certain delight, a certain enthusiasm about the things of the Lord. You were, you were blown away by how much God loved you because you couldn't believe that all your sins from the day that you were born until now were forgiven. And they were not just forgiven, but they were also forgotten. They were wiped away, amen? Wiped away, thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. You couldn't believe it. And because of that, you know, um, you, you were sold out to God. It, it sounded too good to be true. And you pledged, I can almost think about the day you got born again. You pledged to live the rest of your life for him. And nothing, absolutely nothing will separate you from the love of Christ. That was you on the day you got born again. You probably broke up with your boyfriend at the time because you met the Lord. You met a better alternative, hallelujah. Come on, am I telling somebody's story here? Amen, if I'm telling your story, say amen. And, and you decided that you will never miss church for anything. You schedule a time that you read the Bible every day. You were at every prayer meeting, amen. You never missed evangelism when the church was going to win souls. You never missed it. Maybe you even went to church on a Saturday thinking it was Sunday. I don't know if any of you has done that before. Uh, you couldn't wait. So on Saturday, you went to church thinking it was Sunday, and, and you called the pastor to find out if there was anything you could do to help in the church. You remember those days? Come on. Amen. You felt so privileged anytime you were asked to do something in church. It was an honor, a privilege and honor to serve in the church. Those were your first love days, hallelujah. If the pastor made a mistake and did, did not take an offering in church, you walked up the stage to let him know that pastor, you need to take an offering because I can't go back home with my money in my purse. Those were your first love days. I believe somebody is being ministered to right now. And that's when you sing, even when there is no instrument. <laughs> Amen. You remember those days? You sing a song, you know, like, hey, I'll put you in front, in front of my melody. You are all that matters. You are all that matters. And, and you were not just singing it, but you truly meant it and you lived it out. He was all that matters. You, you went to bed and you woke up thinking about God and that's when you made pledges, you made promises and hey, you were sold out to this thing called your new life, your Christian life. And that was your first love. During those times, even you know, if the pastor said something or somebody offended you in church, you forgave so easily. Amen. You didn't take it seriously because you were so deeply in love. And when people are in their first love years, they're always smiling. Even when there's nothing funny to smile about it. <laughs> the next time you see somebody smiling when there was nothing funny, you should know that uh, they are in love. They are in love, okay. But after some time, somebody said, yeah, after some time, after, you know, the spouse came around, right? You know, you had two more ch two children and, you know, they are going on to soccer games after school. They have to go to school after school, go to soccer games. And, you know, you got a very good job and 
the job had very good overtime pay and bonuses were attached to it. All of a sudden, everything changes, okay? Because things are now beginning to compete for your attention. You have studied the Bible more. You've gained more head knowledge about the things of God. But instead of becoming more committed, you have fallen into the trap of familiarity. Oh, yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, I, I know fasting is important. But, you know, I have, um, I'm so busy that I, 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 I can make time for that right now. You begin to speak, speak differently. You know, the sermon doesn't trigger your passion anymore. The sermon doesn't kick you anymore because you've had so many sermons over the years. I don't know if somebody is there right now. Maybe you got hurt a few times by church people. You no longer call them brothers and sisters. They are now church people. When you were in your first love days, these were brothers and sisters. Now they are church people and, and you have a few scars you know, to show that you've been hurt. So you are now careful not to get too actively involved in church matters, right? I don't know if somebody is, somebody is being spoken to right now. May the word of God reach into your soul and minister to you today. If you are right here where you've lost your first love, your innocence, that purity about you, then you are the one that the word is speaking to. You're the one that God is speaking to. The spirit of God knows you and he is calling you out. Amen. You seem to have become smarter. Okay, so you're playing a game with the Lord. According to a, a, a website that I saw it belongs to um, Basic Life Principles, they've, they've mentioned a few things that, you know, people begin to look like when they leave their first love. Let me read a few of them to you. One, you delight in someone else more than you delight in the Lord. Your soul does not long for times of rich fellowship in God's word or in prayer. You make excuses for doing things that displease the Lord. And you say something like, oh, I'm only human. Or God knows my frame. You, you do not you know, willingly or cheerfully give to God's work anymore. You need to be encouraged, pushed in order to give. You, you, you begin to view, view um, the commandments of God as restrictions, too restrictive, you know, you know, to your happiness rather than expressions of his love. The same words that God spoke to you in the beginning that sounded good to you. Now they are sounding too restrictive to you. You strive for affirmation from the world rather than approval from, from God. And, and you, you, you fail to make Christ and his words known because uh, you are afraid of being rejected. Now you are careful about your self, you know, your self-conscious. You no longer want to be rejected. I remember when I first, first love, you know, fell in love with the Lord and became a, a young Christian in my teenage years. We went to predominantly Muslim neighborhoods to preach the word. We didn't go to Christian neighborhoods. We went to Muslim neighborhoods to preach the word. But a time comes down the line when you begin to feel like, you know, these people will never listen. You know, you become, you become complacent, you know, towards sinful conditions around you. Maybe at the time you didn't want to listen to unbeliever music, music worldly secular music, but now you're beginning to tolerate worldly music. And you begin to say things like, hey, um, maybe you say it in your mind, you don't say it out loud, but gone are the days when we used to do so and so. And, and in the church, you know, we did so much for the Lord, but now we're so busy 
What you're meaning is that now you are so busy that you've left those things for the younger ones. May the Lord forgive us. May the Lord forgive us. We have outgrown our first love. We have outgrown our first love. Jesus, Jesus no longer has the first rank in the things that take priority in your life. You know, other things come ahead of Jesus. And it, it may be family. Please listen to me carefully. The things that we place in front of Jesus are things like family and career and leisure activities, right? And sometimes people even place ministry ahead of Jesus, ahead of the Lord. And you are wondering, how can I place ministry? Is it, is it ministry? It wasn't my ministry given to me by the Lord. Am I not serving God through ministry? It's a very subtle and, and very harmless looking trick of the enemy. Because the devil knows that if he cannot get you to deny Christ, so he will not try that. He will rather make you focus on doing Anything that pre will prevent you from being centered on Christ. There's a lot of ministry looking things today that are not centered on Christ. Getting us to focus our attention on your work, your marriage, your, your calling. Amen. You're trying to put all your blood and toil into this thing you call your calling that you've forgotten the caller. Oh, come on. Amen. You are so passionate about your calling, you've forgotten the one who called you in the first place. Praise the Lord. I, I really like um, one of the things that my, my baby does, my, our young, youngest son. He, he's um, once in a while, I'll be in the office, you know, at home, and then I'll be doing something very serious, right? I'll be deeply engrossed in some serious work. And here he comes. He comes around and I'm, I'm like, okay, what, what do you want? <laughs> That's a question I always ask him. What do you want? What can I do for you? And, and it, your heart will melt at his answer. He always says this. And, you know, he speaks volumes. He, he always says something like, Dad, I just want to be with you. Oh, come on, amen. I just want, I don't want anything. I am not looking for anything. I just, he will come around and he'll sit, even if I'm in a Zoom meeting or something, he'll come and sit on my, on my lap. Amen. That is what lovers do, isn't it? You just enjoy each other's company. You just want to be with the Lord. When was the last time you just, you know, came to God and say, I just want to be where you are. I don't want to worship from afar. Amen. I just want to be around you. I want to be in your dwelling place forever. When was the last time you did that? I believe somebody is um, remembering your first love. And I found this quote in the Bible, this, you know, my, my Bible, uh, one of my Bibles is a New Living Translation um, Life Application Study Bible. It says, God, so it says, work for God must be motivated by love for God. Otherwise, it will not last. Work for God must be motivated by love for God. Otherwise, it will not last. So God is looking for workers. God is looking for givers. God is looking for performance. But more importantly, God is looking for lovers. Amen. Oh, I don't know if somebody is getting blessed over here. God wants you to be a lover first. And then you can become a worker. Amen. And how can you return to your first love? Let's round up with this conversation today. And I'm, I'm almost done so we can pray. Amen. How can you return to your first love? Jesus said, return to me by repenting. 
repent. Repent means you are, it, it's a 180 degree turn. If you were going west, he said, I need you to come back east. You've gone too far. I need you to go back to the basics. I want you to return to base. Don't become too intellectual. Don't become too advanced. Now you're spending all your time in ballrooms, in committees, and planning sessions, and writing concept papers and business plans. Yeah, they are all good, but hey, I need you to come back and just be at my you know, feet and spend time with me. That's what God is looking for. He wants us to repent by coming to the Lord in repentance, by allowing the Holy Spirit to melt your heart. You know, a lot of us, you know, we need, we need a softer heart. We need to become malleable again. And, and, and God wants to remold us. The reason you left your first love in the first place is probably because of something called mileage. A lot of mileage has been brought to bear on your heart. So your heart has become hardened. You remember when Jesus told the story of the, the sower, there were some seeds that fell by the roadside. The roadside had been walked upon so many times that it's become hardened. And then the, the, the roots of the seed will not find a place to be established. So if mileage has happened to your heart or traffic has happened to your heart, it is time to come back to the Lord and say, break my heart for what is yours. Break my heart. Your, your heart has become hardened by the multiple issues of life. Hey, the, the um, uh, founder of our church, Dr. Otterbell, uses the term, the vicissitudes of life. The many things that have happened to you in life have hardened your heart. And it's time to come back to the Lord and say, Lord, break my heart. Lord, may the demands of life not take the better part of me. So our stony hearts need to be softened by, you know, the Lord into a heart of flesh. So God can have his way with us. And the next time you rise up in the morning, you just want to walk to the mountains or walk to some quiet place and spend time in the presence of the Lord, your first love. Beloved, let's begin to pray right now. I just want you to pray. I don't know. Maybe somebody is in tears right now. I have the feeling that somebody is in tears. You've realized that you have gone very, very far away from the Lord. It is time to go back to the basics. Lord, I just I don't want anything. I just want to be by you. Just want to sit at your feet. Just want to hear you speak. I just want to hear your voice. Amen. I don't want just to be a, a, a hard worker for you, but I want to be a hard lover of you. Amen. Let's begin to pray right now and say, Lord, bring me back. Bring me back, Lord, to the place where I belong. Lift me up to where I belong, oh God. In the name of Jesus. The songwriter said that falling in love with Jesus was the best thing I've ever done. Falling in love with Jesus is the best thing. Lord, I pray. We pray for your people right now. In the name of Jesus, oh God, that you will bring us back to our first love, like the church in Ephesus, oh God that will not become too busy for you, too advanced, too intellectual for you, too professional for you, oh God. We, Lord, um, the church in Ephesus, was their heart was stolen by, by the commercial activity in town, by the advancements in the cosmopolitan area, Lord. But we, we, we just want to be by your feet. We like that simplicity. We just want to be by, by you and hear you. I pray, Lord, that you bring us back to our first love, that we will love to read your word, we will love to pray with you, for, we will like to pray to you and hear your voice, we will love to witness and talk to others about you. We don't want to stop talking about you, oh God. Bring us back to that first place. We want to empty our wallets and purses, Lord, for you, because we love you so much. 
We would do anything for you, Lord. We love you. We bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I pray for you, beloved, that God will bring you back to your first love. God will bring you back to your first love. Father, cause a return, a supernatural return, a repentance and a return to take place right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we execute divine return in Jesus' name. May our hearts begin to, Lord, boil for you again. In Jesus' name, we pray with thanksgiving. If you are listening to us and you want to accept Jesus into your life, you want to start the journey, you want to be ushered into your first love for the very first time, just pray a very genuine prayer and mean it with all that is within you. Say, Lord Jesus, I have come to understand that there is something called first love. I have never tasted of this before, but I want some of this, oh God. I, 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 I know that you are my savior. I know you are the son of the living God. I believe in you. I believe you lived, you died, you were buried, that you resurrected for me. You ascended into heaven that I will have everlasting life. Thank you, Lord. Come into my life and make me a brand new person. Make me a child of God and write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Lord, for ushering me into my first love for the first time. And keep me in my first love, never to let go. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.